I've been terrified of doing this, but uh, I'm not backing down from this one. I've hurt a lot of people. I've hurt myself. I've been a drug addict. I've been alcoholic. I've said a lot of really rude, mean, mean, mean things to people. Becoming a father, I thought, this is going to be pretty easy. You feed them, you put them to bed, and but it's immense. It's huge, and it never ends. Carl wasn't a planned pregnancy, and I hadn't finished high school yet. There was never really any thought of doing anything other than getting married and raising this child. It was a very unsettling event for both of us. Initially, I, I felt that I'd disappointed myself. I'd disappointed God. I'd disappointed my parents. Carl defied death twice before he was five. The first time was when he had pleuric stenosis when he was first born and, and we couldn't get any food in him. Second time, that was a bad day. Basically rushed him to the emergency ward at Surya Memorial and he's screaming because they're giving him a spinal tap and he's screaming out for me. And it, it doesn't matter how much you hug them afterwards, that trust is broken. My mom would be working and my dad would take me with him and we would go drinking. I remember one time I was, they were getting me drunk when I was a little kid. I, I fell and I smashed my, cut my chin wide open on a glass coffee table. We moved to Vancouver Island when I was six. You know, I spent so much time alone as a child I just remember I had my own little games I played by myself. I didn't have supervision. My mom was busy. Susan worked after school. I worked a lot, but no, I don't necessarily think he was alone. Hmm, interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Boy, gonna have to edit this part out. Ken hadn't had a good relationship with his own father growing up and that colored his understanding or lack of understanding of his own ability to be a parent. There were no kids over to my house to play with ever. And why was that? Did your parents frown upon? I don't really want to, to, to work a lot on my uh, family. Not only did Ken have to deal with being adopted, he also had a terminally ill sister. She died when he was around 13. Ken remembers sitting at the table and saying, boy, I really miss Tracy. His mother burst into tears and logically his father backhanded him and said, don't ever talk about her again. He's told me so many stories of being beaten in, in the hospital. He suffered so much trauma. I could see it in him. I could see it. I got to the understanding that person that you love can just disappear forever, right? They're just gone. That grief that you go through is immense. So you look for something. In my case, it was drugs and alcohol. Learned behavior, I guess. A lot of drunken nights, a lot of abuse towards me and my mom. Ken ended up being laid off. And because I had just had a child, we had absolutely no income. The added responsibility of a second child, he began to feel inadequate. I've seen so many horrible things when I was a child. I actually wrote a song for Carl that says, I know you've seen things that a child shouldn't. I watched my dad um, become enraged. Well, he went out with a friend who was self-employed. They ended up drinking in the middle of the day. When Ken did come home, he was extremely angry. He took a baseball bat to our unfinished basement. Benign in a sense, but terrifying for Carl. And it's another one of those bizarre sources of pride that you have that it never degenerated to physical violence, so therefore it wasn't abusive. But he would come into my room, I'd done something, you know, kid stuff, and his belt would be out and he'd just like 
start like smashing my bed and it had these black marks all along it. And I mean, thanks for not hitting me, but still it's traumatizing. Like, it's just a kid. When I was your age, if I had done something like this, I would have been beaten within an inch of my life and I'm only gonna hit you like a little bit. He would stare at me and his eyes would like vibrate back and forth. Watching him rip the whole railing off of our staircase and he was so upset and he didn't know what to do with his emotions. You know, he wanted to be a hero to his little boy and he hadn't managed to do that on a number of occasions. It really stuck with me. It really like, I hated myself. Remember my dad used to just sit in the garage, just sit there and smoke cigarettes and drink. The smoke would come in the house. He'd be like, if you don't like it, you know where the door is. I remember trying to shield him, but he knew that there was something grievous going on. My great grandma and me were like really close. And my dad and her and my grandma had just, just had the hugest fight. The way that everyone was talking about each other, it stuck with me. Instead of going to school that day in a good mood, I'm already upset. I would always try and fix the situation and try and explain to the other person how like, oh, you know, dad didn't mean to smash all those holes in the walls. Ken would fight very hard to regain control and have times of sobriety only to find himself yet again in situations that he just didn't know how to handle. For me, Carl quickly became that safe person in that new environment where it's like, okay, I don't know what's going on, but he does, so. First day of school, knew no one, walked in. I was always obsessed with music. I, can, I always remember, I was like, I'm gonna play music one day, I'm gonna be a singer. It was grade seven, starting to explore music in different bands and developed a love and a passion together for Nirvana. The album that changed my life. Pure, it's a pure album. It has that nice, like, gritty sound to it. The songwriting on this album, I think, was the best. For him, I think he saw himself in the shoes of Kurt Cobain. I started off wanting to be Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain, what a fella. There was a moment in time where I thought I should just probably go to Seattle and just shoot the fucker. This is my first electric guitar. I painted this myself. I bought it after working really hard for my uncle, Dale. And see all the scars here. I smashed the living piss out of it. He was always crazy Carl. And I'm his little sister, so I just kind of accepted him for who he was, and I always thought the world of him because he was my big brother, and I thought he was the coolest thing. Through grade seven and grade eight, Carl and I spent a lot of time together. We would write little songs with one or two chords. I would go and look in the dictionary, and I would find words that were weird, and then I would put them in the song. That's how it all started. Carl grew up with music in the house. Uh, with his mom being a music teacher. Uh, that wasn't my upbringing. Janet was the actual caregiver. I was the boat driver, and we would be 24-7 out in the water, and I mean, he's going to try anything. You give Carl somewhere where he can flip, you know, he was doing it. He was an engaging person, was trying to please, to fit in, and he knew how to do it. Scott Falk, the youth pastor at the time, really pushed for a youth band, right? Which then was another sort of connection for Carl and myself to play music, to have a connection to the church. Carl needed a place to come and be because things were um, a challenge at home. His dad went through a period of time where he was struggling and that showed up in Carl. Carl in grade seven was wild and crazy, but it was an innocent wild and crazy. But in grade eight and grade nine, there was more drug use starting to happen, playing around with alcohol. 
he'd come back from a weekend when I hadn't hung out with him and he'd talk about starting a fire somewhere or stealing. He was a wild student. We weren't allowed to have dye our hair, but Carl dyed his hair. There was a lot of graffiti happening at that time. There were just a lot of those little rules that Carl pushed against. Ken enjoyed coaching Carl's teams. It gave them a way to connect. My dad had like instilled in me that I should hit kids and I'd hit some kids so bad. The parents of the child had come to the dressing room. And I get in a fist fight <laughs> with this guy from the other team and it's like, Dad's bears like his, the mother was up in my face. Next thing you know, my dad has the guy up against this chain link doing Ken stuff, freaking out. That was the end of it for me. Never got picked for the team ever again. I remember one day where he needed to get to work. Uh, I need to go, gonna get myself kicked out of the game. And so he just started berating the ref and got kicked off the bench. We never went to his house, ever. Just that, like, we don't go to Carl's. We spent most of the time in our friendship at my place. There was talk about, you know, his dad being weird. And I don't know all that that encapsulated. And I don't think I, you know, asked too many questions about it. I remember going upstairs to his bedroom and there was a hole in the wall. And I asked, oh, how did the hole get in the wall? Uh, and he told me, my dad punched the wall. There was a lot of tension. There was a lot of fear walking around on eggshells. There was that knife's edge of Ken either being super happy or Ken being angry. You just kind of knew if Ken was going to get mad, Carl, let's get out of here. We were coming out of like the post grunge era, but you know, don't tell us that grunge was over because it wasn't <laughs> very much alive and well. <laughs> Some rival schools were rolling up on us, and I just remember Carl Schleppi grabbing a sandwich out of his bag, waiting for the right moment, and throwing it, and hitting someone in the vehicle, possibly the driver, square in the face. I think we just kind of had this weird, quirky crew that was super into like alt music, and just kind of hang out together. Really affable, likable guy. He was very kind and sweet and funny, super silly. And you know, his hair was always a different color all the time. I think he started out with really straight hair, but I think after several years of dyeing it every color of the rainbow, it ended up quite like short and frizzy and almost curly at some point. <laughs> you play guitar, I play guitar too. Do you want to come over and turn things up? <laughs> I spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with Carl, like just hanging out, playing music. You know, he was a great house guest, aside from the <laughs> flushing <laughs> paraphernalia down the toilet <laughs> incident. Let's play these songs, and then by the time like a talent show rolls around, we'll be ready. He would carry around a bottle of cough syrup with him, and I was like, what's that all about? I remember him telling me that it's because of like the ragged, screamy rock voice he needs to drink cough syrup to help soothe his throat. And I kind of bought that. I was like, okay. There was something that was truly haunted about him. He really personified a lot of that like tortured musician, tortured artist. I came over from Scotland in 99. Carl was uh, one of my first friends and definitely my closest. I saw something in him from just the moment he started singing and playing. There was a conversation at one point, you know, like, hey, what are you doing with this stuff? And he was like, I'm using it to get high. He claimed he could not concentrate. He thought that he suffered from ADD and he should see a psychiatrist about it. He was prescribed a drug by his doctor called Dexatrin, and it's basically just an amphetamine. 
The feeling was like um, a bit of anxiety mixed with energy and, uh, and creativity. So a lot of writing, a lot of, you just wanted to paint the walls and smoke cigarettes and sweat. together, we uh, laughed together, we drank together, we ingested narcotics together. Of course, we took more than the prescribed dose and Carl, uh, you know, he'd run out before his prescription was up and the doctor would just give him more pills. He would up his prescription amount and so at one point he had 200 pills coming. And I certainly saw the progression of that becoming more and more prominent. Who is Carl going to set off? What is Carl going to say? What is Carl going to do? How did I get hooked on drugs? That's, it's a fun story. I just remember one day I was like, I want to just get, I want to get into some harder drugs. I wanted to try it. I wanted to be high. Like, I'm going to be honest. That's, I wanted to see what it was all about. So I gave my friend some money and Next thing you know, I was uh, snorting crystal meth. I remember just feeling that tension in that house as clearly Carl was driving the show and it wasn't where his parents wanted it to go. Self-control, that was what my dad said I needed. <laughs> he said, you have no self-control, son. So I started a band called Self-Control. <laughs> He always liked to scream at the top of his lungs. And people liked the fact that I could pull the screaming off. There was a lot of deep pain and anger that he would express through his music, and I feel like that was a therapeutic release for him. In the It gave me a purpose. I, I put all my energy into it, uh, all I thought about. John Bradburn, Arlen Peltier, Steve Adamson, Steve Cass, Casey Rogers, who took over for Steve Cass. We started just jamming and getting parts together. were the riffs that he was playing to me when we first started hanging out and jamming. They were really tight. It was embarrassing to have to follow them with my old band that they just made us look like shit. You went away. Through the whole time of being in the band Self Control, I was taking a lot of drugs, mostly prescription pills, like I would say 90% of the time. I had said, hey Carl, let's hang out. We made a plan, and Carl didn't show. And that had sort of kind of become the narrative, was that I would make plans with Carl, I would show up, and then Carl wouldn't. I could hear him from the end of the cul-de-sac. They've got a five-piece band in his room. So I simply yanked the plug out of the wall and said, you guys are done here. Carl would sometimes bring up some disagreements he was having with his family. Uh, I chalked it up to being normal. He was just pushing against my parents. And one day, it literally came down to he wouldn't vacuum his room. And that was just the breaking point. And my mom lost it. She just lost it. If you won't follow our rules, then you'll have to find someplace else. and. Carl basically said, okay, fine, and left. Just get out of here. Don't, don't ever come back. I didn't like his choices. I made different choices. From my perspective, he was just one more angry young man who'd walked out of his parents' home. Sadly, I didn't talk to my parents for probably four years. The Lady Esther. They 
were a huge part of Self Control's shows we would perform together. It was Ryan Steele, Dave Sponigal, Aaron Clausen, and Chris Aruda. I just remember how good Chris Aruda's singing was. She came a surprise. It was a casual wave and all the same grace. They had all these intricacies to this music, and yet it didn't feel like overdone. It was just electric. David Sponigal, um, an absolute legend on the guitar. So I was in a band called The Lady Esther, and we played a lot of shows with self-control and had an absolute blast. Yeah, I considered Carl a friend. We all played in the same scene. We all had respect for one another. We all knew each other. We all loved each other. We all had our quirks. We, won't ever be that way. we all just gave it all, and we got it right back. And it was just this reciprocal thing that's just energy. Grab the broom and rip it up! <laughs> Unlabeled. Punk. Punk, punk, bunch of punks. Lime Cellar were possibly some of the wildest memories. Just really hot, sticky, loud punk rock shows. seemed to be on another planet a lot of the time. We'd do gigs and he'd be absent-minded. I know some of the guys in Unlabeled were reluctant to, to do shows with him or to have him at our shows just because who knows what he's gonna do. Not me, I always had a, a soft spot for Carl, which is why you know I allowed him to live with me. He slept on my floor. There was couches, but it's just a Carl thing. After the gig, he'd be out in the streets and always had a, his bottle of pills and he just downed the whole bottle, just the whole bottle of pills. I thought he was gonna die. I'm like, no one can you know, drop that many pills and just, but Carl could. shit gonna go missing who's he gonna have over at our house he's not fucking paying rent but you know Carl got us our first gig he was a big part of the scene there was a great scene in Nanaimo for music back in the day there was self-control there was unlabeled there was Lady Esther it was a, it was just a really robust music scene and these were all kids doing this stuff when he was playing at the Canby you could tell that he was a user meth I ended up pulling the plug on them. They were fucking loud. They had all their little posse, all their little mohawk buddies out there. <laughs> they, they had a following, for sure. I was feeling optimistic, was thinking that my band was about to go somewhere, so I thought everything was gonna be good. Yet at the same time, I was really unsure how things were gonna turn out. Everything would always feel like it was that far away, like you were just like in this numb little blanket. Clean and sober, you're welcome here. I will never. Stop loving you. And there will be those awful times. Inside Out, deep meaning for me. I've always enjoyed that track, um, just because it does speak to me on a on a quite a, a high level. 
Derek Rathy took me under his wing and produced Inside Out. He basically taught me how to sing because all I did was scream. And he was like, no man, like do some singing and mix it in. And I think you can tell the progression in his musical ability because of coming from some of the earlier stuff to that song. That was the song that to me he was most known for and wherever we went I always wanted him to play that song. It's a great song. I wish more people could hear it. He did call me up once one time and say, "Hey, let's go to Sugarloaf Mountain. I need to I need a friend." So we went up to Sugarloaf Mountain and he busted out a big flap of cocaine and it was the middle of the day and he said, "You want something?" I said, "No, no, not right now. Thanks." <laughs> That was the day he heard that he was going to be a dad. I could tell that he was deeply, deeply troubled. Uh, I don't think he was ready to be a father, and certainly I wouldn't have been at that young age. When he found out he was a kid himself, like 18, I think, and he didn't really know what he was in for. I came unglued. I am a going to rehearsal one night and I like drank half a bottle of Robitussin DM. I was like, felt like the world was like over here and I'm at rehearsal, no one noticed. Yeah! I had no outlet for all my pain. My life was unraveling um, pretty quickly. I don't remember there being any real downward spiral. It was always sort of the same old Carl. I think I'm one way, but I'm actually looking another way. I was in a really dark place. Carl was spiraling out of control with his drug use. In my heart, I knew that he was really sick from the drugs. My life exploded. My band left. I was on drugs. I had a baby on the way. So that was it. And I was alone. You're not necessarily going to make it. And here again, as parents, we were just trying to shield him from that, that inevitable failure. They sort of fizzled out around that time, unfortunately. My band was my shield. It took away my shield. It was like walking around the world naked. And then all I'm supposed to do is be able to like pick up the pieces. When I didn't, I don't even know if I wanted to pick up the pieces. Carl continued to self sabotage. We sort of parted ways, not in any bad blood, just sort of started doing our own thing. Well, I just heard that like Carl's not doing good. It made me sad to hear that. But you know, I didn't reach out to be one of those supports to him. 12 pills a day, just just to function, not, not just like having a good time. Like we're talking like, wake up in the morning, there's a glass of water, you put five pills in your mouth, drink it, close your eyes again, because you can't open them, and then all of a sudden the, the pills kick in and then you're going. <laughs> And lunchtime, it's like you don't eat a sandwich, you have a handful of pills. And then at the nighttime, you have another handful of pills. That was where I was at. I, I was starting to get into like some kind of psychosis. January 23rd, 2003, Mason Sodden was born. I'm like 20 years old and one month. When you get overwhelmed with stuff going on and you kind of like trick your brain just so you can deal with stuff, I, I'm pretty sure that's where I was at with this. I was scared that I was gonna ruin his life. I don't even have my own house. I'm living with my girlfriend that I just had a baby with, parents. Mason's mom came to me and said, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I believe Carl has a serious drug problem. Once their relationship broke up, she was uncomfortable giving Carl access one-on-one. -on -one. I 
I was, I was a mess. I was no, that was no good to anyone. I found myself thinking, you know, if this young man's life ends this way, I will feel guilty. And I will feel that I've failed him. Perspective is everything. I had far less concern for Carl than perhaps a lot of other people did because it was pretty mild. I know how I partied. <laughs> I understood a lot of it as something that most people go through. It seemed to be being portrayed by the people around him as something worse than it was. I was staying at my parents' house. My dad drugged me out of our house. And he was just laying on the end of the driveway. And he was just crying, and I was just heartbroken for him. They drove me to Edgewood, and they, they said, we got you booked in at Edgewood, son. We love you. And I said, I don't need this stupid program. I can stop doing the drugs. That's not the problem. They love him so much, right? And I'm happy to pay for him to go into a facility and get clean if that's what he wanted, but that's not what he wanted. So he got out of the car and he left. Jesse was like, hey man, we're gonna rent a full house so we can jam there. There's a room in the basement you can stay in for 300 bucks. You could not call this a bedroom, it was disgusting. He preferred to have that bedroom. There was no arguing. He paid a little less rent. So living at the Halliburton house was like a nightmare. And it was cold. It was cold in the basement. That's where he wanted to be. He was happy down there, and that's kind of the way that Carl was. He was happy just being that skid punk street rat. I was completely destroying myself. Had a suicide attempt there. Yeah, I think he did feel more comfortable being there. I've been strung out on drugs, laying there, like curled up in the fetal position, just crying, missing Mason so much. I hadn't seen him in forever, and I basically become everything that I didn't want to be, which was a shitty dad. Some of it, the ways that he he would express himself could rub people the wrong way. Like he would he'd scream sometimes at someone's face. It was off-putting at times. There were some not so fun times, and then there were some pretty rough times. Something involving someone's Harley, some people were punched. Um, I think I may have hit Carl. I think I may have hit Carl. It got to a point where his son's mother said, you can't be around our kid until you sober up, which was probably one of the best things that could have ever happened for him. Good friends of mine, the Hennessy brothers, that would let me stay at their house, and I remember putting the pills on the shelf, and I was like, that's it. I quit everything, I quit. It was hard not being able to see him and be with him because I was trying to get sober. Carl kind of was around the music scene early 2000s, and then he just kind of disappeared. I think he just sort of got out of the music scene. We just sort of lost touch. That's when I met It's embarrassing to think about how shitty of a person I was. I would take off, go down to the bar, and then not come home. I would lock her out of the house. I would call her names. Stuck with her. That's, I think that's a lot of what I would say to her. I mean, like, how harsh is that to say to somebody? And now she's pregnant. I just, I just lost it. Left her like pregnant at the apartment and didn't even help her move or anything. Mason, dance. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mason, I'm Carl's son. <laughs> Cause I know my dad was trying to do the best he could for me. The alcohol is affecting the way that he was being. You know what I mean? He wasn't like yelling at me because he was drunk, but little things that would be alarming to other people were normal for me, like having an open beer in the car or something like that. When I got the call to come down to the hospital to meet my son, wasn't really in the headspace to do that, but I realized I needed to be Odin's dad. I loved him. What's going on, Odin? You catch it on your tongue? Put your tongue out. We used to go and do lots of fun things when I was little. 
Some of my best childhood memories were definitely with my dad. Go do fun things out in the bush. What did What did you do today? We gathered firewood. And? Built a fire. And? Who watched the fire the whole time and made sure it was ripping? Me. We've always had like a relationship between us, like a bond. I've seen that man work harder than anyone I've ever met in my life. He was providing for me, my little brother, on pretty close to minimum wage. Hard labor, too. The next three years, there was a lot of really good times, but when it was bad, I got drug out of the house naked one time by two police officers. That doesn't happen to people that are sober, you know? Cycles of doing the same thing that my dad did. Push the pedals, Ode. You gotta push. It's hard work, but it's fun once you get the hang of it. There you go, there you go. Stop! I was around in Odin's life till he was four. I destroyed everything, and uh, I ran away to Alberta and worked in Alberta for the next two years. <laughs> you see that shit? I hated life. I hated everything that I was. I disgusted myself. I was ashamed. I was suicidal because I didn't see any other option. Me and Odin's mom were married for six months before we filed for separation. When he was in Fort McMurray, he was, he was alone. He was alone up there working. Yeah, he'd call me almost every day. He was still married, but separated. It was a bit of a whirlwind for sure. I, I honestly don't know what I would have done without Chrissy. She's my rock. Like, she is everything. Feel my heart. He moved in with me the day he got back. You name it, like, she made it happen. Paying for counseling, picking my children up from school. Serious man. There was lots of times where he would start playing his acoustic guitar, but then he'd just break down into tears. The tension you crave. I hadn't said, no, you're good enough. Somebody got him to read a book called The Four Agreements. That was pivotal for him. I realized that those two boys, their life wouldn't be better without me, and that I did have so much to give. He worked really hard to just maintain his sobriety through music. I'm tired. And he basically gave up the bottle for his guitar. And I started dealing with myself. I started taking responsibility for my actions. And I believe in you. My counselor, Maggie, she saved my life. I wouldn't be here. I was headed for a really bad place. On October 28th, 2016, I went to my buddy's grave and I drank half a two six of Fireball, but that was it. I, I promised my friend, I said, I, I got the memo. That moment when you first realized that Carl was gonna be sober was an amazing moment. I, I wanted to buy him a beer. He's been sober for quite a few years now and when I was a kid, he definitely was not sober. Proud to see him able to like, kind of move past that and be like, I'm not what I was in the past. I can be a new person. He came to the point in his life where he told himself, I'm better than this. It's been great watching Carl fight his way back. I mean, it has been a fight. 
through each step, you could see Carl was proud of himself. He proposed to me about two years into our relationship. And then all of a sudden he was just like, I have a ring for you and will you marry me? We've had some really good memories together. He's helping me become a man now. I was a kid when I had Mason. It's so surreal to stand back and look at the amazing young man that he's become. I'm just so grateful. Odin, he amazes me. They're into RC cars. Odin helped build a chicken coop. The relationship with his kids was getting way better. And then he started, he started playing again. I was doing sound at the Longwood Brew Pub, and then all of a sudden, there's Carl. And I haven't seen him in, I don't even know, years. And he's kind of keeping a low profile. I think he was wearing a hat. It was kind of like watching the music. You know, I said, I should maybe, like, you know, I used to play. He encouraged me so much. It was like the big push I needed. He said, why don't you, why don't you book a show here? And he was like, oh, he's a little hesitant. And then I pushed him, I pushed him. And eventually he did, and he played it, and it went really well. And you could tell it went really well because he, it was like he just came alive. <laughs> Ever since then, he's been laser focused on, on kind of getting back. I can't see. It's impressive to see someone come out of that and, and just come out the other side being like a better person, you know? A lot of people don't get out of that. Wounded people wound people. And that's why wounding people is such a bad thing to do. Because it doesn't end just at that moment. You can leave scars on your kids. And Carl knows that firsthand. You know, to come out from pain doesn't come easy. Uh, you know, there's a price you have to pay to come out. Perspective again. Life has been good for, for all of us. Um, we're very fortunate that our troubles were as small and as minimal as they were. I'm going to take that step. And yeah, you, no one's going to believe me, but I'm going to take that next step. I'm going to show up for birthday parties. I'm going to be there. I'm not going to run anymore. I can't remember the last time I saw him. There will be those awful times Life will be so low and tough Nothing makes any sense at all Things just aren't feeling so right To be discouraged at all It just seems like it's so hard Muster up some courage, don't fall down Never give up so easily times have gone through when those times have gone through when this life is so easy when this life is so easy everything just don't make sense it all makes sense things are perfectly in time Just seems like it's so hard. Muster up some courage, don't fall down. Never give up so easily.